Welcome into The Scoop, part of the Inside Carolina Podcast Network, brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt and Blue Shark Vodka. I'm your host, Ross Martin, joined by Don Callahan. And today we're having a big-time interview with the father of UNC wide receiver commitment, Andre Green. Stay tuned. All right, welcome into The Scoop. As I said, I'm your host, Ross Martin, and we're joined by Don Callahan. Big show today. Don, what's going on, man? Not too much. I have a uh, shameless brag real quick since we haven't been. This is our first podcast in a long time because they, they kicked us off that one week. But uh, during that short period, my my daughter made the high school basketball team. Right. She start, she's starting on varsity. I mean, I'm sorry, starting on JV, not varsity. Starting on JV, uh, led her team scoring the first game um, despite being in foul trouble the entire game. Got three fouls in the first quarter. But the uh, second game, stay out of foul trouble, but didn't score nearly as much. I think it was she only had two points, but played uh, most of the game. So super proud and super excited uh, for her. What's nice. going on in Ross's world? Big time dad moment. Um, nothing, man. Just focused on bringing great content, great UNC-centric content to our uh, Inside Carolina subscribers, listeners, and followers. Um, all right. So we have a, a pretty interesting show. We are like exactly two weeks recording this on Wednesday, December 1st. We're exactly two weeks from National Sign Day. It's uh, on December 15th. We're going to bring on the father of Andre Green, UNC's wide receiver commitment. His, also, his name is Andre Green as well. Um, we're going to bring him on in a little bit. Before that, we're going to get a couple topics that kind of leads into Sign Day and kind of helps wrap up the 2022 class. And then we'll kind of close out. Um, we're going to preview kind of the, the live stream we're going to do for Sign Day wrap up some housekeeping stuff and get out of here. How's that sound, Don? That sounds absolutely wonderful. Great. And of course, this is brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt and Blue Shark Vodka. We'll talk more about those um, a little bit later in the show. Okay, let's get into the meat here. So, Don, I read your scoop, and right now is uh, a contact period for, for UNC football recruiting. So that means the coaches are out on the road. They're meeting with players. You have Mac Brown posting a fit picture on uh, getting out of a private jet. What's really going on? Can you kind of give us an insight um, into kind of how this process works right now? Well, you know, actually, this is one of the negative effects of how sped up the calendar is. This used to be like a really big time with a lot of movement within commitment lists and just, you know, situations in general. But it has become such a formality because most, most commitment lists are solidified by this point. And unless you are going through a coaching transition, North Carolina obviously is not. So most of Mac Brown's in-home visits, as they're called, even though they're not all technically in-home, are to see commits, guys who have been committed for, you know, six, six months or more. Uh, so there are a couple of guys, you know, we'll get into them, like Gunnar Gibbons and um, Benji Gosnell that Mac Brown will visit. And there's always the potential for others to pop up, but really, Mac Brown's, Mac Brown's trips are just to see his commits and to lock everything up and to make sure everybody's comfortable with signing in a couple of weeks. So he's just darting around to all the commitments, going to the, 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 the homes, the parents or restaurants or wherever they meet. What do those meetings and visits look like? Because he knows the family pretty well. He knows the player pretty well. Obviously, he probably doesn't know all the family members, hasn't seen their hometown or, or, uh, or their home. Can you give us a glimpse into what these meetings are like? How long? What do they do? What do they talk about? Do they eat? What's going on? Well, obviously, it's, it's a case by case basis. You know, based on situations. You know, you know what, you know, Mac Brown, Mac Brown schedule, the family schedule, and all that. But it, it really is just kind of like a hangout session in a way, and getting to know, make sure all remaining questions are are answered. Um, they will, although it's probably because. So what happens? So Mac Brown can only visit a recruit once during this this period it's two but, period. well yeah, this it's this week these two weeks and then it's also resumes after the dead period but most of these guys are actually all these guys in north carolina's commits are going to be signed but if you are still recruiting guys then yes you, it goes on beyond that but anyway but the assistant coaches can visit every week so one of the topics that does come up but it's usually kind of reserved for when the assistant coach is meeting with the, the family without Mac Brown is just kind of making sure everyone understands the letter intent process, signing it. I mean, it's pretty simple, but you, you know, it, it's, it's a little strange if you've never done it before. 
Um, and then also, if you're an early enrollee and North, North Carolina has nine early enrollees, you're kind of talking about any sort of, you know, paperwork or, mm-hmm. or requirement left that needs to be handled before then. So you're, you're really just tying up loose ends with a lot of this stuff. Does the assistant coach make his second trip or his first trip with Mac? You, so, so essentially, let, let's take um, Andre Green. for We can ask Andre Green's dad because um, you know, we'll have him on. But um, and I think yesterday, I think it was that um, Mac Brown came by and I assume Lonnie Galloway was there, too. So. So, yeah. So yesterday, Mac Brown and Lonnie Galloway next week, Lonnie Galloway will return. Most likely we can ask uh, Mr. Green that uh, without Mac Brown. And that's probably where, you know, Galloway will kind of go over, you know, just any extra details, you know, the signings and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, interesting. All right. Good stuff. So, and then there's, you know, like you mentioned, like usually this time before the sign period got moved up, they were trying to go get new yeah. players, trying to make visits and try to convince them to commit right now. It's more convincing. It's just like, uh, you know, um, it's a formality. That's really all it is. Yeah. Formality is a great word there, but there are two players that UNC is still recruiting who remain uncommitted. Um, one is a Virginia tech commit and one has a lot of Virginia tech interest. Let's start with Gunnar Givens, a offensive lineman from Virginia. Um, tell us what's going on with his recruitment. I'm going to give you the bio stuff here in a second. Yeah, so he's been committed to Virginia Tech since, I think, June. You know, UNC showed him some interest. UNC offered, showed him some interest early on, but backed off when it kind of felt good about some other guys on its board and end up getting, you know, a three of, of the guys high on his board. Um, but then when it, when it saw that it had some extra space, decided to kind of kick the tires on Gibbons, see what his, where his interest was. They were able to draw him to campus for that final home game against Wofford, which is a big uh, first step for North Carolina. The next step would be to get him to come for an official visit, which as far as I know, he has not completely committed to. Okay. Um, Virginia tech just hired. Well, I'm assuming, um, it's official with uh, with Brent Pry that Virginia Tech has has hired him. Um, I saw the reports yesterday, but I haven't had a chance to. Yeah, it's official. Check. Oh, it's official. Okay, mm-hmm. so a lot is going to depend on just you know how he feels with that with with that situation, and you know he he comes from a big Virginia Tech family. It's close right. by, and I think that's going to make it hard for North Carolina. But um, it's definitely a situation to monitor. Okay, so Gunnar Givens is a six foot five, two hundred seventy pound offensive tackle from Daleville, Virginia. He's ranked uh, one seventy six in the nation, so pretty high recruit. Uh, number twelve uh, interior offensive lineman and number seven player in Virginia. So four star guy that UNC had offered early in the process, committed to Virginia Tech, remains committed to Virginia Tech. He visited UNC on an official, sorry, on an unofficial basis. He went with Zach Rice, and UNC is still recruiting. Is is Matt Brown or our coach is going to go visit him? You think? I I believe so. We have to check out the weekly scoop. Okay, and that's and and trying to get him to uh, schedule an official visit and kind of go from there. Um, you know, strong ties with Gene Tech, and has he pushed back his uh, signing day now? Yeah. So um, need to mention we we go in full detail as much as information as we have on this situation, which is not easy considering he's not willing to do any interviews, but uh, within the weekly scoop this past week and the week prior also. But um, yeah, so he told me that he intends on signing in February, which actually North Carolina does not like North Carolina wants to get this because obviously the more you're giving Virginia tech more time to mend fences and get them comfortable and everything like that. So UNC would love in in the perfect scenario, get him to officially visit that weekend prior to the sign to the December signing period and then have him sign during the December signing period. Yeah. If he delays it, that's two months for UNC's new coaching staff to convince him to stay. He's got Virginia tech ties. He lives in Virginia. He's been committed. He is committed already. So Virginia tech obviously has the leg up. All right. Gunnar Gibbons, UNC's recruiting as offensive. I know I I saw a jumbo athlete, but you think it's offensive lineman. So I think one of the, the attractive things with him is the fact that yes, he's he's projected as an offensive lineman, but he could also play defense. And actually, that was what he wanted to do early on. I haven't talked about that recently with him, but during his, his junior season, he had, had expressed a desire to play defense as opposed to offense. So um, he has that ability. He plays both sides of the ball in high school. Okay. 
as we say, always sign more offensive linemen. You need these four-star, elite, uh, high-level offensive linemen, defensive linemen. Okay, uh, we're bringing on Andre Green here momentarily. But let's talk about Benji Gosnell. Pretty interesting recruitment. Benji Gosnell is listed at tight end. Um, you know, some will call him an athlete because he, he can play defense as well. He's from Pilot Mountain. I believe he had transferred to a school in Virginia. Yeah. Is that right? Is that Carroll yeah. County? Yes. So that's not, he does not go to uh, East, Surrey. East Surrey. Correct. Where yes. his brother, Stephen Gosnell, where Jefferson Boaz went. Uh, six foot five, 240. Uh, four star guy, ranked 323 in the nation. Number 15 tied in, number 12 in the state of North Carolina. He was committed to Ohio State for, for a while, um, mm -hmm. pretty early in the process, never visited. He decommitted a while back, too. And then the interest was with Virginia Tech and with UNC. And interest with UNC has ramped up here recently. We have a couple of crystal ball picks for UNC, um, including a multi-time scoop podcast guest, Brian Doan, friend of the program. Uh, Donald, what's going on with Benji Gosnell? Uh, right now yeah so he's another situation where north carolina felt like it kind of finished what they needed to to obtain in this class had a couple extra spots has a you know a four star that essentially is in-state guy even though he technically lives just over the border now um, so decided to kind of pursue him obviously his brother's on on the roster makes it a little bit easier family are big tar heel fans um so yeah so um he is scheduled to officially visit North Carolina this coming weekend. He is still interested in Virginia Tech. That's another situation. You got to see just how the new coaching staff at Virginia Tech impacts things. I think it's going to, I think this is the opposite of the uh, Gunnar Gibbons situation. I think North Carolina has a much, is in a much better spot with uh, Gosnell. Okay. Uh, if you were to make a, um, well, let me ask you this first. What held Gosnell back from having interest in UNC? Or was it vice versa? Was it UNC not showing as much interest in him? So UNC was a finalist for him b before he committed to Ohio State. And if you remember, I mean, that all occurred during the, the pandemic. So everything was all virtual. And I would imagine a kid from a small town, Ohio State comes knocking. I mean, it's Ohio State. I mean, let's be let's be honest here. If we're not if we if if you take off your your Carolina blue glasses for a second and Ohio State's comes knocking and wants you to play for them, then you're, you're going to listen. And so I, I think that he, he fell in love with that whole idea and stuck to it. And by the time he decided, hey, you know, I haven't even visited this school that's really far from my parents. He decommitted in late July. By that point, I mean, UNC had most of their commitments locked in already. And same with most other schools that were recruiting him. So I think initially when he decommitted, North Carolina is like, you know, North Carolina you know, had filled up at his positions and was like, uh, we'll take you if, if, you know, if you really want to come here, but we're not going to go out of our way. But then once they kind of realized, okay, we have some spots, this is a good player. We can, he's another guy who could play multiple positions. He could play tight end. He could play outside linebacker, play inside linebacker. Um, you know, he, he plays all over the place at his high school. So, you know, a guy like that, you can find somewhere for him to play. Okay, awesome stuff there on Benji Gosnell. Okay, uh, Don, if you had to pick right now, where does Benji Gosnell play football next year? <laughs> these, uh, these questions have got me in so much trouble in the past. But I feel like this one's such a layup that I'll, I'll, I'll take it, that I'll go with, uh, I'll go with North Carolina. <laughs> Okay, Gunnar Givens, where does he play football next year? I go at Virginia Tech. Okay. Hey, you know, do you remember, we haven't talked since the uh, Andre Green commitment. Now, now, here's the thing. If Gunnar Givens picks North Carolina and some other poster brings that up, I will never answer these questions again. I'm just going to put that out there. Why? Why do you care? Be, I mean, because every moron wants to bring it up like two <laughs> months later. Oh, you said this, you know, <laughs> forgetting the fact that two days in the recruiting process is like two years. You know what I mean? Like I, you, you asked me a question in like May and in like, I think it was like October, I was wrong. And it was like, Jesus, well, I mean, look at all the stuff that occurred between those, those moments. Yeah. Hey, do you remember when I made you pick, um, I think it was like six players 
that that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. How many would go to UNC? And um, on it was it was it was Andre Green, mm-hmm. it was Zach Rice, mm-hmm. it was Travis Shaw, it was Jake Pope, George Petaway, and might have been one more. And and I made you pick. I mean, how many of those six or five? Yeah, it was like over you, under. Yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what I'm all, referring to. All but Jake Pope, I believe, picked UNC. Now I think there was one that we're not thinking of. I'm not sure what, what he did. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember the exact one. It just shows you how well UNC's recruiting. They're landing the guys that you know. Even Don Callahan doesn't think uh, <laughs> UNC will will get commitments from. I mean, Zach Rice, uh, Travis Shaw, massive recruitments. Andre Green. George Petaway, all these studs. I mean, those are the top five players, um, top four, four out of five on UNC's commitment list. Um, so it's pretty incredible. Okay, before we bring on the father of Andre Green, who is a big time scoop podcast listener, um, let's talk about the top five for, for the next time we record. So next time you hear our voices after you listen to this podcast will be a preview of the 2022 signing day podcast. It'll be a big podcast we do. Um, it will come out at some point leading up to signing day, which is in two weeks on Wednesday. We don't know exactly when it's gonna come out. It might be a, like a, a Sunday or Monday type deal or the day of, we'll let you know, of course. But um, that top five is going to be the top five signees from UNC's 2022 class you're most excited about, okay? So you're going to send Don on email over DM on Inside Carolina or on Twitter. Top five, look at the whole class. Which five are you as a UNC fan most excited about seeing as a target? Don, comments? I mean, I think this is probably everyone who listens to the podcast should be able to easily do this. Even yeah. if you just randomly, you know, I guess print out the list of commitments, put it on a wall and throw darts. You should be able to give us five send it to us let's have a good amount because some of the uh, su- submissions lately have been lagging i think we mm-hmm. only got a few for uh candy bars um yeah. for halloween candy bar so let's get that submission number up for this time around so that and we it, can it, have a little fun with it it'll be interesting to see who y'all pick and, and why you know because sometimes the best recruit is maybe not the guy you're most excited about based on yeah. need based on avail- availability and things like that Okay, we have Andre Green waiting to come on. But before we bring him on, I want to talk to you about Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com, right online at johnnytshirt.com. Get all your holiday shopping. Use that 10% off discount code for Inside Carolina subscribers. Sweatshirts, hats, toboggans, jerseys, T-shirts, anything you need. It's an easy way to get your Christmas shopping done. I'm probably going to get some stuff for my niece and nephew on Johnny T-Shirt. Um, I'm also I need a wedding gift for a, a buddy, too. I might just get uh, him and hers, UNC sweatshirts. So Johnny T-shirt and Johnny T-shirt.com, a local company. We definitely want to support local. They've sponsored us for years, right on Franklin Street. Great customer service. Warehouses right in Hillsborough. Johnny T-shirt.com and Blue Shark Vodka. Hold on. Oh God. <laughs> Blue Shark man, Vodka. Great oh, sponsor of the live show. I got two bottles here. Didn't you just buy uh, buy that one bottle last night? No. Uh, these were given to me. Blue Shark Vodka, a great local vodka out of Wilmington and Wrightsville. Uh, check them out online and then their Instagram page, Blue Shark Vodka. Um, you know, partnered with Connor Barth. They've been a great sponsor of our podcast and great sponsor of the Inside Carolina Post Game Live Show with me and Sean Drone. It's smooth, it's easy, it's affordable, it's accessible in all 100 counties. It's, it's um, locally made with North Carolina sweet corn and mellowed and smooth. Tons of different cocktails, like a holiday cocktail, cranberry juice, uh, ginger ale, cranberries, and uh, some sliced orange. Put some ginger beer in another one. It's a great uh, way to uh, enhance your cocktail experience. Blue Shark Vodka. Coming up next, we have the father of Andre Green. It's Andre Green. Here we go. (laughs) Welcome back to The Scoop, brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt and Blue Shark Vodka. We have a very special guest. We have the father of four-star wide receiver and UNC commitment, Andre Green. His dad, Andre Green. What's going on, Mr. Green? Not much, man. I'm glad to be a part of this. You know, you guys have – it's my favorite show, man. I look forward (laughs) – 
Spain. Yeah, might be the first time we've had a, a player who is getting recruited by UNC listen to the podcast before he committed, <laughs> and, and now it's come full circle, and you're a guest. So we're, we're, we're very happy to have you. Um, Don, we're going to head over to you to kind of get this thing started. Yeah, so for multiple podcasts, I've been mentioning how Mr. Green is a big fan of this podcast. So now I think a lot of people probably didn't believe me. So <laughs> well, let me ask you that. How did you begin to listen to our podcast? I know we're not supposed to make it about us, but I do find this aspect kind of interesting. All right. Well, you know, with Dre, you know, I've always been a, a big part of uh, Dre's commitment. I always... <clears throat> I listen to the podcast. I read uh, a lot of media. I, I read everything. I listen to everything. So I had um, originally had uh, got on, uh, I think it was YouTube, and I seen, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the scoop on there. And I was like, what is oh. this? All right. And so I started <laughs> looking at it. And I started listening. I was like, man, they talking about Dre. That's my <laughs> son. And so, you know, ever since then, and then, you know, you and I, we've already had a you know a long-standing relationship and I was like that's my man Don on there too <laughs> I know that you was a part of the, the school podcast at first yeah um, I try to I try to keep keep that aspect of my life quiet I don't want people to uh to know about it but yeah um but I, as far as Dre's recruitment the one interesting thing I find is that so you guys took a very um meticulous um organized approach and very you know ambitious too because you guys narrowed it down to 15 schools <clears throat> you ended up not visiting all 15 but almost all 15 during the summer and then the plan was to take additional visits a lot more i assume maybe i assumed wrong so you can correct me mm -hmm. if I'm wrong a lot more visits during the fall but you ended up taking that one visit for the um georgia uh, clemson game in charlotte then you went to north carolina for the duke game and then you took the official visit to Clemson. That was really it. So what happened there? Did you guys just get tired or were you guys starting to kind of feel like you knew what you wanted to do? Yeah, well, you know, of course it was, you know, it was, it was very time consuming, uh, financially consuming, you know, but, you know, at the same time, you know, we wanted to make sure that Dre had every opportunity to see the schools that he liked. And um, so, you know, we, we narrowed it down, you know, Dre had like, I think it was 58 offers at one point. And um, once we narrowed it down to the 16, you know, it was like, hey, look, you know, are you really like these schools? You know, so he was like, yeah, I do. So I was like, hey, let's do it. You know, I have a, you know, I, I've been saving up for a long time for it, you know. So I say, you know, we can go take these um, visits, see what you like, and then we'll narrow it down a little bit more. So by, by the time the, the fall came, I think we had a good idea of what schools he had probably liked the most, what schools was a little bit more realistic as far as, you know, what he would go to and, and everything. So, and then at that point, we narrowed it down to the six. After that, you know, we had to kind of look at it and say, man, you know, at this point, it's getting really close. You know, we're getting close to the fall, you know, we're getting close to that December time and, and everything. So, you know, once we kind of sat down as a family, his mom, myself, uh, his uncle, you know, we all kind of went through everything. We went through the visits, you know, what we liked about the schools, you know, what we maybe didn't like. And, and then, you know, at that point, we kind of narrowed it down to the three. And that's kind of where it came from with the Georgia Clemson and UNC. What was it like having all those offers and having so much attention for your son and having all these coaches call and and, and visit the schools, like, was it just overwhelming? Was it cool? Like, it's just in such a unique, you know, childhood and, and unique experience for a father. What was that like to have such a, a really good player with all that interest from almost every major school in the country? Right. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that. It was a lot of highs and lows with it. You know, initially it started out as a high. It was like, oh man, wow. You know, all these schools, it was like back to back. It was, you know, it was Georgia, it was UNC, it was UVA. No, I mean, it was those schools, just, it, it was just back to back. And then, you know, after a while, and he started, you know, fielding the calls, I think it really became overwhelming for him. Mm -hmm. You know, at that point, you know, I kind of had to, you know, sit down with him and say, hey, look, you know, school is first. You know, you can't be up, you know, talking to coaches all night. And, you know, Dre is a really good kid. You know, he's a humble kid. He wants to, you know, talk to every coach that call him in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And everything. And so we had to, you know, kind of had that conversation. And, you know, it was good to be a, 
a father and be able to help them through it and navigate, you know, through the whole process. So, you know, I was able to talk to some of the coaches and let them know, hey, look, you know, we'll, you know, J Dre is unfortunately not going to really be able to talk to you every week, every few nights and stuff like that. And so, you know, it was a lot of, um, you know, ups and downs. And I think um, even for Dre, you know, it was emotional highs and lows. And then at some point, you know, once he got used to it and got a handle of it, he was great with it. So, you know, it was a unique process, but it was a great process that, you know, Dre understands that is definitely a blessing to, you know, have all these, you know, wonderful schools, you know, um, interested in them. So it was, it was good. With, with the visits, what were, I mean, obviously you know, we've talked a bunch about the North Carolina visits, you and I, um, right. but obviously, you know, you and I have talked, you know, on the phone about, you know, meeting coach O and, and yeah. going out to Oregon, you know, and so what were, I guess, some of the moments, not necessarily from a standpoint of helping Dre make a decision, but just were like cool, like fan moments for you. Oh, man. Yeah, like, you know, like you said, man, look, anytime you have a chance to meet these coaches, you, you're talking about Kirby Smart, Coach O, uh, Coach Sweeney, uh, Coach Brown. I mean, um, I mean, it, the list goes on and on, you know, with all of those schools, you know, Texas A&M, Lincoln Riley, you know, I mean, it goes on and on. It was it was a, it was definitely a, a great opportunity, a, a, you know, some great moments for Dre and, and, and myself as well and his mom, you know, so we enjoyed the whole process, man. It's not many times you get to go and, and be the highlight, you know, it's like and those schools treat you really, really good, you know. Um, you know, it, it's been a, you know, wonderful process. You know, th those coaches, those schools is great. You know, I, I don't have anything bad to say about any of those schools. They were wonderful. Every last one of them, you know, really treated us good. So, you know, it was just, it was just a blessing. Do a quick fire here real quick. What was co a couple coaches here? What was Coach O like? Man, look, he was so down to earth. You know, he talked about – uh his movie scene, what is it, the, in the blind, blind side? Blind, yeah, man, he talked about that. We talked about that. Man, that guy is so down to earth, so cool, so, so laid back. And, you know, I think when we went to um, LSU and we talked to Coach O, I think we was in his office for about two hours talking to him. I mean, that long. I mean, so, you know, they really took the time, you know, to um, – you know, have conversations. And it wasn't even all about football, you know, and everything. So they're, you know, real people, real people. What was, uh, what's Coach Link, uh, Lincoln Riley like? You met with him, it seems like, too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Another laid back, man. You know, you, you, you see these guys and you think when you see them on TV, they're going to be like oh, so high strung and, and everything. But, you know, another, you know, laid back, really cool, you know, um, you know, just just great people, you know, great people. You could tell that these guys has been successful. These coaches has been successful for a reason. Yeah. He's, he's uh, Southern California. Cool now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Of all the visits you made, other than UNC, what campus or like football facilities blew you away the most in terms of like, man, man this is awesome. This, it's big. It's awesome. It's whatever. Oregon. Really? <laughs> Oregon, Clemson too. Clemson was really, you know, they have a great facility as well. But, but to me, you know, um, Oregon was amazing. I mean, I had never even, it was amazing, man. Everything from the uniforms to the glass buildings. And, you know, it was, Oregon was definitely, you know, to me, one of the most amazing places. That's that did Nike get, money. Did you, get yeah. to go, did you get to go down the slide in Clemson? Oh, like several times. I think, yeah. I, went, I think I went up, came down, went back up. Like it was almost like it was a game, man. You know, so, you know we literally, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah. All right. Go, going back to North Carolina, when, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously this was Dre's decision, but, and you right. had a front row seat. You had the best seat, you know, front row is probably not good enough to say, but um, right. when did you think, the light kind of went on for North Carolina with Dre. Man, you know, the light went on for North Carolina from the very beginning. You know, everything from, you know, when you start looking at, 
you know, some of the things that was really important, Dre, which was um, education, you know, was a great part or a big part, I should say, relationships, proximity. You know, those are some of the things that you mentioned as well, I think, in the last podcast, and you was right on with that. You know, those were some of the most important things. And so when you looked at UNC, they had all those things, you know, um, you know, and then the, you know, I can't speak enough about the relationship, I would say, you know, with um, with Dre, you know, as well as the family with uh, Coach Brown, Lonnie, awesome, awesome. Um, Dre, you know, Dre Bly, um, Coach Bates, you know, the whole staff. It was even, you know, uh, just the whole staff, uh, Molly, Alex, you know, I mean, it was, it was amazing. So I think from the very beginning, you know, UNC did a great job with recruiting Dre two years ago. It started two years ago and it was really consistent. I'm not talking about, hey, look, you know, we talked to you once and then we talked to you two, three weeks later. I'm talking about Lonnie is one of the, you know, the, the best recruiters. He's really, really good, you know, with the family. You know, um, I mentioned to you, even when I had the back surgery, you know, you as well. You checked on me. Lonnie checked on me. Coach Brown called several times. Um, so, you know, and, and for Dre, you know, just checking on him, making sure that he's okay, not even talking about just football. Um, they, they did a really, really good job. So I think that UNC from the very beginning, they made sure that the grandma was okay. And, you know, the uncle, you know, the whole family. And so, you know, those things was really important. I think that, you know, from the beginning, you know, we kind of knew that it was going to be, you know, in the, a front runner. Then you mentioned uh, Galloway, and I think I believe he was like a rival's uh, national recruiter of the year, or, you know, mm -hmm. a few years back or whatever. What, you know, because you got to see, I mean, because I'm sure most staffs put their best, their best recruiters on Andre. Right. What, what I guess does, uh, does Galloway kind of do to be successful as a recruiter? You know, I think that the first thing is, you know, of course, football is, is very important. You know, that's one of the, the main things. But he was really real. He seemed genuine. When I say, like, you know, I say he talked to Dre. Like, I mean, he made Dre a focus, a focal point. And when I say he talked to Dre almost every, at least every other night, <laughs> seriously, or called at least every other night, um, you know, for like two years straight, man. So he, he used to always joke and say, look, man, if Dre don't come, I'm sending the helicopters to Virginia. <laughs> and uh, it, it was so funny because he put so much um, time, energy, effort and um, into the recruitment. And we felt that. And that meant a lot. You know, anytime that, you know, uh, you know, schools like that put that much time and they have so many different other kids that they're recruiting, you know, it showed that they really wanted Dre. And um, I think Dre felt it. I think we felt it as a family. And that was great. Outside of the, uh, obviously there's a really strong connection with the coaches and the staff. Um, mm -hmm. I know you mentioned academics and too, but is there anything from the football side that really attracted you to UNC in terms of the scheme they run? in terms of how they thought about, um, they, how they told you they're going to use Andre in the offense, things like that? Yeah, definitely. You know, that was that was a big part as well. You know, we felt like, you know, Dre would, and, and he felt this as well, like Dre would be able to actually go there and make some kind of an impact early. You know, you look at the type of offense they run. You know, it's a really, a, it's a good scheme for, for Dre because um, Dre is one of those players, even though he's big, you know, he's he's probably more like 6'4 now. I think, you know, all the stuff listed him as 6'3 probably, um, you know, from the sophomore year. But Dre is more like 6'4, and Dre is extremely fast. He can jump, as you can see. You know, he can play multiple positions on the field. He's not just going to be that that one uh, big that you just say, hey, let's just throw it up to him. Yeah. Dre can really do it like he's shifty. He – he, he can block, you know, he, he's a, he's an all around uh, wide receiver. And I think that they recognize that, you know, we want to make sure that he, he was going to be prepared because, you know, at the end of the day, his goal is to one day go pro and, 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 and make it. And so we wanted to make sure that he was in a system that he can grow, continuously grow and not just be used in the, you know, as a one trick pony. So, you know, it, you know, North Carolina, their scheme is, you know, it, it fits very well. 
Was that mostly Galloway conveying how they'd use him, or do they bring in uh, Coach Phil Longo to talk about it, or, or is it everybody? What's the deal there? Everyone, man. You know, we sat down with Coach Longo for about maybe an hour and a half uh, previously, and he went over film and showed how he would actually use Dre, which was great. Uh, Coach Galloway did the same thing. Um, and then, you know, Coach Brown, he just reiterated, you know, hey, look, you know, we talk about these things and this is how we'll use Dre. You know, we're not just going to use him in, in this capacity. We're going to use him. And he's going to be a big part of our offense going forward. And, you know, so when you couple that with, you know, uh, Josh and some of the other players that they have right now, you know, I think um, UNC is going to be a, a great team in the future competing for you know, titles, you know, I, I don't know if it's going to be immediately because they do have a lot of young guys, but I think that, you know, next year, year, you know, year one, year two, next year, and um, going forward, I think they're going to be, you know, um, a team to be reckoned with. I really do. And, and you know, kind of wrap up this kind of recruit, recruiting portion, or at least the staff portion, people always talk about how good Mac Brown is as a recruiter. We never get to see exactly what he does and says. What does he do that is is so helpful or is so great with parents and with the families mm -hmm. and kids that makes him kind of a special elite head coach recruiter? You know, uh, they actually visited yesterday. Um, uh, coach Coach Brown, uh, Lonnie, and Jay, uh, Coach Jay, and um, you know the sense of, of of Coach Brown, what you get from him is he's genuine. And I think that's the biggest part. You know, you talk to a lot of coaches, you like you talk to a lot of staff, a lot of schools, and you know, you just get to feel like he's being truthful with you, you know, and that's important, you know. Um, and again, it goes back to, you know, one, he delegates his guys, you know, he does a good job at not only putting his coaches and his whole entire staff together to make sure that they're recruiting the players, but, um, but also the players as well, you know, um, it's a great camaraderie, you know, and, um, you know, he talks about all those things. And, and like I said, you know, coach Brown is a legendary, he's a legend period uh, coach. And, um, and I see why, you know, it's, it's so hard to say, this is what it is. But when you actually talk to him, you just really get that feel that he's a genuinely um, good guy. It's good that you brought up the, the in-home visit because we were talking about it earlier. Ross has asked me just what happens during an in-home visit. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, we need to ask uh, Mr. Green. And I completely forgot about it because I didn't jot it down. So, you know, for someone, obviously, most people aren't going to get to go through this. So you know, when the coaches come in to visit with you and visit with, with Dre, what, what's, what, do you, what do you guys kind of do? What's the process there? You know, it's so laid back. You know, uh, they actually we actually met at the school uh, okay. at Dre. And, um, you know, we had lunch, we ate lunch there at the school and, um, you know, it's very informal, you know, we talk, uh, we, we talk about football, we just talk about, you know, it's, it's a lot of small talk, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's good because you get a chance to, you know, this is not just the first time we've, you know, we've met, you know, with, with North Carolina coaches many, many times, and we've talked to them, you know, several times times as well but it's very informal you just have a chance to sit there and talk and laugh and joke and then you know I think um one of the the, the best parts about it uh for for uh, a kid a student athlete is when it's at their school you know everyone else gets to see hey you know um you got Matt Brown and, mm -hmm. and, and you know coach Lonnie and Jay and them there and you know, that was that was really, really special to meet the staff. You know, that's the other thing. You know, we walk through the, the school. They have a chance to walk through the school, walk through the campus, and meet some of the teachers, meet some of the kids and, and everything. So it's, it's really informal. You know, it's not like uh, you sit there and they go over film again. You know, it's, it's just very laid back. Great. I want to step back a little bit. Uh, we've kind of talked about his recruitment and, and, and UNC a lot, but it came down – we feel like between UNC and Clemson, especially with that that last visit to Clemson a couple of days before his commitment, how close was it with the Tigers? Um, and can you just talk about, you know, the difference between the two schools and, and what kind of 
uh, what was so attractive by Clemson and, and why it was tough for Andre to pick and why UNC ultimately run, won out? You know, so going into the Clemson visit, um, I think that in Dre's mind and, and in the family, it was like, you know, UNC obviously held the lead, you know. Right. That, was the, that was the truth of it, you know. But Clemson, of course, wasn't out. Georgia wasn't out. Um, Georgia, we just didn't get a chance to actually um, – you know, go there. It just wasn't enough time, you know. And so, you know, Georgia, you know, Coach Hankton and, and Coach um, Smart, great, great recruiters as well. You know, we had a great time with them. And I think that they possibly could have been, you know, a little bit more in the mix as well, but we just didn't have enough time to visit. So when we went to, um, prior to going to Clemson, like I said, UNC was, you know, it was in the league pretty much. And um, when we got there, and we spent those two days. Coach Sweeney is Coach Sweeney for a reason. You know, they have a successful program. You know, they've always, you know, they've had it for years. And it's the reason for that. Another great recruiter, him and uh, Coach Grish, Coach Grisham. Awesome. And, you know, once we got there and um, we spent time with them, you know, of course, you know, we were there previously as well. But they was able to, you know, go over, you know, some of the same things that, you know, the other schools went over, which was, you know, this is how we'll use you. And, um, you know, uh, we got to spend a lot of time with um, Coach Sweeney as well, you know, and that was something that we didn't get a chance to do previously as much. Uh, but we pretty much spent, he spent a lot of time with us and, um, you know, he did a great job recruiting Dre. And so, you know, by the time the visit was over, with everything that we had went through with Clemson, it was a lot closer than what uh, most people thought. It was really, really close. Um, but I think that once the dust settled a little bit and we was able to kind of sit down as a family and, you know, talk to Dre about what he wanted and what was important to him, um, I think that, you know, UNC was, that was in his heart. That was in his heart the whole time. And I think it really, it probably didn't help Clemson as much that we got the offer late from Clemson um, as opposed to, you know, UNC had been there from the very beginning. And, uh-oh, some gum, man. But, um, <laughs> but like I was saying, you know, I think the, the biggest part was UNC was in Dre's heart, you know, pretty much the whole time. And um, that's what we felt. And we told him, look, you know, follow your heart, man, um, you know, uh, do that and you can't go wrong. So that's kind of where the way it ended up. So you let, me, I... let me say real, real quick. Okay, go ahead. What is coach Sweeney saying when he's with Andre for hours and hours? Is he like selling Clemson or is he like, come on, commit, commit. Like what is his approach when he is trying to convince your son to commit knowing maybe UNC leads, like how, how do you, how would you put into words how he um, does that? Cause he's pretty effective at it. I imagine. He is, he really is. Um, you know, he didn't, you know, it wasn't once that he put pressure on us to say, Hey, look, commit now, commit before you leave or anything like that. You know, he basically let us know this is what Clemson has to offer. And um, this is how we can use Dre. And this is how we're going to prepare Dre. And, you know, he, he told us, you know, point blank, he said, look, you know, wherever Dre goes, he's going to be successful. You know, he made it clear. He's like, look, wherever he goes, I'm not going to say he's not going to be successful wherever he goes because he is. He said, but this is what I can do. This is what Clemson can do for you. This is how we can prepare Dre to accomplish his goals and what he wants to, you know, do over the next, you know, after, you know, um, his college career is over. So it was more around that. And, you know, he, he you know, again, he showed us film. Mm -hmm. We actually watched film with Coach Sweeney himself for about, it was roughly about an hour straight. And he was so, he was so pumped up. He was so hyped during that meeting it was it was it was crazy you know it was, it was crazy to see but that's that's his you know he's just effective at what he does you know and that was what he talked about how he would use Dre and how you know hey look you know don't get caught in you know almost what I was talking about earlier you know someone just trying to you know use Dre as a you know a, a throw him up target you know it was like Dre is so many different things and he's seen a lot of wide receivers you know in in his years and he feels like Dre is really that 
that talented. So now afterwards, you and I spoke and mm-hmm. you, you spoke to a couple of different media people. And I remember um, that one, I was like, I would never want to play poker against Mr. Green because uh, <laughs> I remember me and another media person were uh, kind of deciphering every little thing you said to try to see, you know, where you're leaning right. and all this. Um, so what, when, cause obviously you kind of went on a little bit of a media tour, which, which is awesome because it, it provided right. the, 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 um, the fans and subscribers, you know, great insight into the announcement. It was great to kind of promote the announcement and everything like that. But so mm-hmm. when you were kind of mentally getting ready for th- those sort of uh, phone calls, what, what was your mindset on how you were going to make sure you don't spill the beans? Well, you know, this was Dre's moment, you know, and, and you know, it's hard. I wanted to make sure I was so focused on making sure that I didn't give anything away. You know, it was <laughs> like, uh, like I said, this is his moment. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I don't <laughs> give it away. I, I don't want to give too much. I don't want to, you know, give too much away about anything one way or another, you know, because to your point, you know, everything, you know, I, I watch the message boards sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> all of that. Everyone reads into so many different things. And it was so, it was so funny. I think I read something on the message board. It was a UNC hat and the UNC hat was more folded like this. Oh yeah. And I think someone mentioned that. It was like, oh yeah, they knew when they well, see he- the hat. Well, we need to, if you don't mind, we needed to tell the hat story. So, oh, so do you mind? Do you mind talking about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, so let I him finish, to, let him finish the folded hat, Don. Oh, fi- oh, you finish the folded hat, and then and then I'll set the stage for the for the for the hat story. All right. So finish no, what you were was, saying. It, it was really just that, and so okay. like, when I was reading the message board. You know, it was so many different things that people was reading into and I was like man they really paid attention to the hats and it was but they was right on with it they was they was right on with it because Dre was trying on the hat prior uh-huh. to it. he had it folded and the other hats was more flat like that and I said that's, oh my god I that's was like, so hey, funny that's yeah so but that's, with some, that, uh, that's something Spexter got yeah, so, right there well, hang on. Yeah. So that's so funny that like, I mean, message boards are so nuts and so crazy. So it's funny you saw some of that stuff because it's a it's a different world of fans yeah. where they're picking apart every bit of everything to figure out who's going where, what coach is going where, and, and what right. recruit is going where. It's just an underbelly of of this whole college football world. It's and it's really hot right now with all the the coaching changes and yeah. tracking flights. Yeah. The recruitment's the same way. So it's it's funny to kind of see your perspective from the other side, Don. Yeah, so um, I guess it was a couple hours before I was about to leave to go to Richmond for, for Dre's announcement. I'm packing my stuff up. My phone rings. It's Mr. Green. I'm like, uh-oh, did something happen? A change, whatever. Answer the phone. And he says, Don, do you happen to have a Georgia or Clemson hat? And I said, no. So explain what kind of happened. Oh, man. So, you know, through all the excitement, you know, I kind of forgot to, to to make sure that we had the three hats, you know, uh, you know, during the announcement. And so, you know, I was going to the stores like literally that whole day from that morning to, until, you know, probably let me see. He did the announcement. Of what, what was it? Um, 6.15? Yeah. It's probably I didn't get the hats until about five o'clock. Uh, <laughs> Because, and I was like, I was so stressed about it. I was like, oh my God, how are we going to do that? I just forgot about it. So, you know, most of the um, the stores, they would have the UNC hat, but they didn't, you know, because this is Virginia, but they didn't have the Clemson and the Georgia hat. So I wound up going on Facebook Marketplace and buying a, a, <laughs> a Georgia hat. I actually got it up for a refrigerator. And, and then one of my friends wound up having a Clemson hat. So that was the way we actually had the hats on the, on the screen, man. I was like, oh, my God, I was so stressed. And, but <laughs> Ray never knew about it. Oh, really? About it. Yeah, he never knew about it. Oh, wow. You asked Don if he happened to have one of those hats before he got Yeah, I was like, do you tracks. have a Georgia hat or, or a Clemson hat? It's like, I think yeah. he got a USC hat. He was, he was desperate. He was desperate at that I point. Was. <laughs> so you, start, you start carrying around like just a, a variety of ACC and SEC hats. So, so you have do, them available for all the announcements. Well, I do yeah. have a bunch of UNC hats for when I go to, to whatever, a practice or whatever. And believe it or not, a lot of recruits don't have UNC hats, even commits. 
So I'm like, all right, let me go grab a hat from my, my trunk. And they put the hat on, take the photo. So I do have a bunch of UNC hats. You're right. But, but no, I do not have I Georgia didn't, or Clemson. I didn't know that those photos that we, that you, we use a lot are, it's featuring your hat for the yeah. photo, the photo yes. shoot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's you know, another part I was going to mention about the recruiting process, I'll mm-hmm. tell you the fans for UNC was a big part as, as well of, of Dre's recruitment, believe it or not. When we look at Twitter, man, the support that the UNC fans was given, you know, we, we got support from a lot of fans, but I think overwhelmingly UNC, the, the fans are just behind you. And we love that. I love it myself. I monitor Dre's Twitter accounts and, you know, look at that stuff. And it's like, man, they are really supportive. And I love that. I can't wait to get there, man. I really can't. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. Yeah. How about on the visit? Um, like when you were at the game, how were the fans coming up to you and they recognize you? Because Dre has a pretty recognizable haircut. Um, were, were the fans coming up to you a lot during that visit as well? Definitely. You know, I think I told you, I said, look, man, you know, that's your name, image and likeness is your hair. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I don't know how, you, how he's going to work that out, you know, during the season with the, putting the helmet on. But he has the little <laughs> puff that comes up. But, you know, we was in the um, we was in the stores. We was in the line like during halftime. And, you know, people would come up and, you know, ask for the pictures and, and, and stuff like that. That's so you know, it, it's it's so neat for Dre. And then I think the one kid, Braden, uh, that's on uh, Dre's Twitter, he had, the, you know, Dre's shirt with Dre's number on the back. And, you yeah. know, he's 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 an awesome kid. He's one of the best recruiters. Braden, shout out to Braden, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I think UNC has a pretty good, like, Twitter army that, that that's pretty good at, at recruiting through Twitter. And I think the message board itself, so we have a pretty vibrant message board community. And there's a lot of fans that are in one place at Inside Carolina that really care about recruiting. And, and that's pretty powerful when, when recruits come to campus and, and on social media, for sure. OK, Don. Don is, is telling me he has no further questions. And I'm good, too. It was just a great glimpse inside recruiting. I, mean, I could talk to parents forever about yeah. the recruiting process, just the co- this questions about other coaches and how they do it and everything. So we'll definitely have to have you back on um once you come on once you gotta come on again so maybe we'll do something um before andre enrolls maybe um maybe in may or june he, he is he's a june enrollee right he is he is yeah yeah so maybe yeah. we'll try to have you on uh later in the spring or something that'd be that'd be awesome and and you'll be just like um just Love like Co- uh coach glover tony grimes his dad you'll be you can be one of our oh, yeah. regular guests <laughs> oh yeah that's my guy too man yeah that dion is yeah, you know, he was another a big part, you know, from the very beginning. You know, Dion had called me and was like, look, let me just give you a, a you know, from a parent perspective, you know. But but really, over time, it was it was truly that. And I know he helps a lot of kids with getting recruited. It's not just a UNC fan yeah. thing. You know, uh, I love that guy. He, he does a great job of just helping kids. And a lot of kids really need that um, during the recruiting process. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's so important. So, you know, I just wanted to make sure I gave him a shout out too, man. But thank you guys for having me. I felt like well, I was thanks for being with, with, with Johnny <laughs> T shirt and, and blue shock vodka. I know it all. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's my price up when Dre get there. You know, we're gonna be doing some uh, name, image, and likeness stuff. So I'm just giving <laughs> him a shout out too. <laughs> that's right. All right, awesome. Guys. Keep it up. Well, thank right. you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, we'll be right back to wrap up this podcast. We appreciate uh, Mr. Green hopping on, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to The Scoop, brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt and Blue Shark Vodka. Uh, we'll wrap up this podcast here. That was a great interview. I thought it was one of our best interviews uh, in terms of the guest and just how concise, clear, and information he gave with Andre Green. So we really want to thank Mr. Green uh, for hopping on uh, there. Don, your kind of thoughts on the interview. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of what I expected. You know, um, he, he and I talked a lot these past few months and it wasn't I me. Mean, obviously, we we did some interviews, but there was a lot of just conversations that, you know, I call him just for kind of an update on things. And, and it quickly turned into, you know, you know, as I mentioned to you, you know, we were talking about coach, you know, why LSU fire Coach O. Now, this was before uh Chip Kelly was not Chip Kelly. Um, Brian Kelly was was uh, was hired, but um, and then talking about Michigan, all this sort of stuff. Just 
we were able to kind of evolve into different conversations. He's a big college football fan, which I think is interesting to, to see someone such a big college football fan go through the actual recruiting process and, and meet all these coaches. So I always kind of got his take on those sort of things. And, and I think it's, you know, Andre's recruitment was so such a heated battle. I mean, yes, it seemed like North Carolina had the lead there for a good portion of it towards the end, I guess, but it was not the slam dunk. You North Carolina had to work until the very end. Clemson definitely put up a huge fight at, to the very end, and, and North Carolina was just able to win out because it built that lead, but and also because it sustained it. What were your yeah, thoughts? And- you could tell you tell he's a good dude, solid dude, and you can tell that he's a great father. And that's kind of and I, I haven't talked to Andre Green Jr., but uh, he seems like a really good kid with a level yeah. head on his shoulders and, and should, should be very successful in college. So love to have him back on. We talked to him after the, the show, after the interview about getting him back on in the spring. Um, yeah, I mean, it was I always want to hear about other recruitments and like strategies and techniques. This is a world we don't know about. You're in it more than I am. But we're still not in the building yeah. in the room. So asking questions about other coaches and and kind of what Mac Brown's like and, and what Don and Galloway's like and how they approach these recruitments, um, I think is super interesting. So that's why, you know, we talk about some other schools, but I think it's cool to get those perspectives about yeah. how people do it. And, and and I can imagine there are some people listening to this who are like, why are we talking about Coach O? Why was Ross asking about Dabu Sweeney? But if you're a college football fan, this stuff should interest you and you really want to know your enemy, you know, and kind of know what they do. And and that's kind of part of it too. And, and if you really think about it, we have from the North Carolina angle, we've covered Andre green completely 360. So, you know, it's, it's done and over with. So it's good to kind of get a looking back and and get, get more details on other aspects of it that we haven't covered. I mean, I love college football and I love this coaching carousel stuff and all this stuff is so intriguing to me. That's why it's so interesting. I mean, this coaching carousel is nuts. We should yeah. talk a little about that if we want to. And we got yeah, let's yeah. What did you, what did you think about the, the what the um the Brian Kelly stuff? Yeah, apparently the um his meeting with Notre Dame just leaks like a two minute speech he made to the team before he left. Um, look, I haven't read a lot about it. All right, Brian Kelly goes to um Brian Kelly goes to LSU, but you also had Lincoln Riley before that go to uh, USC. All right. So Brian yeah. Kelly, I mean, I think he just wants to win a national championship and you, you're, you're competing in the, the toughest conference. It's, it's tough to win there. Um, it's tough to win everywhere, but it's tough to win at LSU when you're going against Texas A&M, you're going against Alabama, Auburn every year, Florida, I think Texas A&M or LSU plays Florida every year. And it's a different kind of recruiting um, pool there too. He's been able to recruit any player he wants now. I think Notre Dame has some restrictions in terms of academic stuff and the type of player they seek and the type of player that would be successful in South Bend. But I think a school like LSU, man, you can pretty much go for anybody. So he's the opportunity to um, to, to compete for a national championship. That's what he wanted. And you know, the last three coaches that coached at LSU won a national championship. You had Saban, you had um, um, Miles, Les Miles, uh, Saban, and uh, Coach O have all won national championships there. So it's, it's funny, but it, it is it's odd, but you never know what inspires these people. And, and, and you never know what goes on behind scene, behind the scene in terms of dynamics with the athletic director or, or what motivates these people. What do you think? Well, so I, I had read that um, he was getting a little burnout in Notre Dame. I think that the academic re- restrictions that they have is, is mm-hmm. you know, difficult. Um, and then also, I mean, it's, it's not you, you don't have a ton of talent in state there at all. Yeah, it's now, cool. Yes. Um, and now you're going to LSU where you have not only you have a ton of talent in Louisiana, but you don't have a major um, you don't have any power five schools in the state besides LSU. It's a great job. And, it's a top five. And job. yeah. And all those kids want to go to LSU, dream of going to LSU. So mm-hmm you can definitely win national championships there. The, the problem is, is you can't have a down year. You have a down year, you're on the hot seat. Now, I think Brian Kelly, though, I don't think people give him a whole lot of credit for what he's done at Notre Dame. Yeah, I think people great. are like, what, they haven't won a, pl- a national championship. Well, who has? I mean, there's only like, what, three, four schools that won a national championship the last however many years. And so those are the top tier. Notre Dame has been in that second tier that a lot of schools would just love to be in. They've been um, in the college football playoff, I think, two times. Yeah. Three times. Not, not many schools can say that. 
Yeah, at for all. sure. Um, I think it's tar- tar- tough to recruit to, to Notre Dame. It's cold. It's in the middle of nowhere. I went there. It's 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 literally in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's two hours from Chicago. There's not much else there. Um, it's like a different fan support because it's a private school in the state. There's not like everything around Baton Rouge and L- is, is about LSU. and Everything in the state of Louisiana that is about LSU. It's not as much like that at Notre Dame. You have a, a big fan base in Boston and in New York and in the Northeast and all the Catholics that are huge fans of Notre Dame. Um, it's just a different, it's a very different culture fit. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out as well. All right, Lincoln Riley from Oklahoma to USC. That, that was surprising. happened before. That was as surprising, just as surprising. Yeah. A powerhouse like Oklahoma, who's going to the SEC at some point soon. So and there's a lot of factors in play there as well. What do you think about that move? Yeah, that was that was really surprising. I think in hindsight, I wonder if Oklahoma long term is is in some trouble. If you think about it, it's it's really they don't have like a ton of talent in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. and you know you you lose your coach. Um, who actually attracted a lot of those guys, attracted all those kids from California, mostly to play for him, because I, I think the quarterback has already um, committed to USC. Um, and you're going to the SEC where you're not going to be the top dog anymore. Mm-hmm. From the USC perspective, it, it, I think it's a great move. And I think you know he's going to have some things rolling there pretty quickly. Uh, because I think he's going to, he's a big name. He's going to attract all those kids that have been leaving yeah. California. In California, that's a hotbed for quarterbacks, for, for skill talent. And there's just a big state with a lot of people. Now, my buddy Wayne House said that high school football in California is kind of dying, but it's a big, big state with a lot of players. And yeah, a lot of the elite quarterbacks are from that area. Yeah. Uh, you pretty much only were competing with like Oregon and, and maybe UCLA a little bit for, for, and, and then in schools like Clemson and Alabama that come into your state. But, if UNC, if USC is is to the level back where it was with Pete Carroll, he'll have no issues recruiting. Oklahoma is interesting, you know. Not, I'm assuming Oklahoma is not a hotbed for that much talent. They probably have some talent. Yeah, they have some. Most, most of their players are from Texas, and in Texas, you're competing with University of Texas, Texas A and M, Texas Tech, SMU, um, TCU, and then you're competing with LSU for talent, um, Arkansas for talent, and it's a big state, but. There's a lot of fish in that pond going for one uh, recruiting pool. And you add in the SEC, it's going to be harder to win. Just like yeah. I said, Texas A&M, LSU, uh, Texas, Alabama, Auburn. At USC, man, that's a, a shit conference. So um, you got Oregon, which is good. And then sometimes a school like Stanford or Washington will pop up. But if you can start landing elite talent, I mean, it, it is your conference to win at USC because they have the money. They have support. They have the the LA, the allure, all that stuff. So um, probably a little easier to win there. But Oklahoma, I mean, Oklahoma's been great. They've been the college football playoff as well, and he's been really good there with a lot of top uh, quarterback recruits, quarterback commitments. Yeah. What about a a move that happened much closer, at much more, I guess, reflect uh, uh, impacts North Carolina a lot more? Virginia Tech. Yeah, they just landed. Any any thoughts on uh, Brent Pry? His resume looks pretty good. I mean, he's coached a lot of different places. He seems to have kind of ridden up with um, the Penn State coach, whose name is James Franklin. Franklin. James Franklin. Um, he was there with him at Vanderbilt. Uh, I mean, by all accounts, a, a pretty good defensive coach. No head coaching experience. Uh, has some background in Virginia and, and in North Carolina and Tennessee, so kind of that recruiting base. But I think it was kind of made for maybe some financial reasons, maybe for some stability. I didn't get the big name. So if you're a casual Virginia Tech fan, I don't know how excited you are in terms of making a splash hire. But who knows? Some of these, some of these coordinators, some of these position coaches, if, if they're a good dude and they can recruit and if they can, you know, build on their their history, um, they can become good head coaches. Look at Dabo Sweeney. Um, look at all I mean, everybody started somewhere, you know. Yeah. So who knows? I don't know much about him. I never heard his name but, yesterday. As people know, I mean, I, I, you know, I grew up a Penn State fan. I don't know. I'm supposed to mention that too much, but uh, I'm not like I'm not. I, I don't consider myself a Penn State fan anymore, but um, I still follow what they're doing. They were led by their defense this season, especially once um, the, the quarterback got injured. But I think I really think and I was actually talking about to Ben about this. That I thought it was a great move for Virginia Tech because he fits. You, you can't just throw any coach at Virginia Tech. It, you have to have a certain mentality. And I think that lunch pal, hard nose mentality, defense first. And I think Brent Pry brings that. 
Yeah. And he's also a really good recruiter, which, okay. you know, we probably could have asked uh, Mr. Green a little bit about, you know, the lack of Virginia or Virginia Tech being involved with his son's recruitment. You know, um, we can have Coach Glover is very outspoken about about uh, their in-state recruiting there. So I'll, that's one thing that needs to change at Virginia Tech. You know, stop recruiting Texas. God, how dumb is that? You know. <laughs> I mean, really, how dumb is that? Like, it, it, it's not sustainable. Even Wasn't that like a thing that, they, like, for a couple of years, they try to recruit Texas really hard because there's a lot of talent there? Well, yeah, but, I mean, you're never going to get the really good talent. But if you recruit in-state, then and even if at first, you you know, like right now, Brent Pry is going to have to kind of get his footing. And so at first, he might not get the top guys. But you have there, – there's a potential to get all the top guys in-state if you take care of the state. That's not going to happen if you're Virginia Tech recruiting Texas. You're never going to get the five-star guys out of, out of Texas. It, it was a stupid plan. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So Back to Virginia Tech. Yeah. I mean, like, I think it's a weird place to recruit to because it's kind of hard to get to. Um, yeah. There's no, like, big airport. Like, UNC is positioned well because there's an airport 30 minutes away that flies from anywhere, and it's right on 85, close to 95, and close to 40. Virginia Tech's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. It, it's, it's not – not very close to DC to kind of go out to the mountains to get there. And then even there, there's not much around. So it's kind of a unique place where they have a great, I think they have a great football culture there. Yeah. Um, they have a great history. They have a, a little bit of a, you know, kind of a, yeah, definitely like a football school and a great, a great fan base, very yeah, passionate they, fan base. Yeah. And so, I think, I, I think you can do stuff with that. You just have to know yeah. what, what you are. And yeah. I think that hiring Brent Pry does that. They've been they've been pretty good in the past, and they haven't been awful. They've they've been probably just as good as UNC last in the last fifteen years. I mean, who's been better, UNC or Virginia Tech? I mean, probably a toss up. Yeah. Um, as as much as UNC fans hate to hear that, it's not like UNC's been some powerhouse the last fifteen years. Virginia Tech has not gotten back. <laughs> no, I gotta I gotta ask you. You've been getting attacked like crazy. I probably yeah, shouldn't ask board, you about this on the message message board. boards on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I, I love it. Friend. I haven't read the thread on the message board. Purposely? I'm too scared. Or been busy? Uh, a little bit of both. <laughs> Dude, I mean, people say such mean things. It's like, what are we doing here? Uh, well, like, the crazy thing is like, yo, you, you, went, you went to UNC, right? Dude, I'm a massive UNC fan. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I journalistically, like, try to be brilliant and biased. And yeah. I, I try to, I mean, I just call, dude, this is the issue. <laughs> Rant here. Tune out, people. People hate the, the, the truth, man. It's like yeah. the truth. I, get, I try to provide a truth and share some of its opinion. But the thing that on Twitter, all I said was UNC lost to Georgia Tech. Which they have. Like, what do you want me to say? I, I'm sorry. Did UNC beat Georgia Tech this year? No. They lost to Georgia Tech. It was an awful loss. And I'm sorry if it came out a little harsh. But I don't know why people got so mad about that. Like, there's well, way think, more things I say. Yeah. Well, they... I think it's not just the truth. It's, it's anything that's negative and people don't understand that the truth can be negative. Yeah. You know? and, like, and you wake, can't wake up man. like life isn't all butterflies and rainbows and, and no. Carolina blue, like freaking, you know, sunshine everywhere. You know, like there's some, there's I'm some with life. you. And I don't, and, and obviously I, I, yeah, I, I definitely understand you're trying to be journalistic. I think though, I think you can be, pragmatic and still be a diehard fan you know and yeah. i and so this whole concept is not exclusive to unc fans many fan bases if not all um are uh you know have crazy segments you know i deal yeah. with it with flyers tons fans, fans are negative fans. tons of fans are negative and they're just see it how it is like i have a, tons of carolina group chats and everyone you know complains a lot about everything football and basketball like it's yeah. a lot of negativity and there's, I don't know, people, I guess don't people, I think people don't like me because because of the platform I have on Twitter. They don't like me being negative because I don't know, or like me posting things that aren't as positive about UNC. Well, I think because there's, there's complaining everything. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Some other um, sites have writers that are cheerleaders and yeah. that's just never going to be us. Yeah. We're not really allowed to do that as much. Well, uh, not even, I mean, would you want it's to? Just silly. It's like, yeah, it's not really like a good way to cover the team. No, it's not. And right. there's a reason why that we are one of the best websites out there from any measure whatsoever. Yeah. You know, color covering college, a college team. Yeah. So, like if, if a player sucks or like a team sucks, like I'm not going to say they're good. Like, why would I lie and say that? Oh, yeah. UNC 
made some great plays late in the Insta State game. I'm not going to say that. I mean, um, so yeah, I get destroyed on Twitter. It happens a lot, dude. It happens once a month now on Twitter. I love it. People. I love I block, it. Yeah, uh, block. I've been blocking more people this year than ever before. People saying mean things, dude. If they only knew half the stuff I wish I could tweet and I have to delete, like people are just. It's so sensitive. It's unbelievable. Like, oh, I know. It's all the raw, the true raw Ross. It'd be unbelievable. I love the true was, raw Ross. If I was giving have you, a- speaking of which, have you mentioned about the live recruiting no. show? We'll get into it. We'll get into it here. I'm, I'm trying to think if I need to say anything else. My one oh. time to express myself. Um, people talking about my hair. <laughs> saying I'm a bad podcast host. <laughs> I mean, someone's pretty funny. I think a lot of people are joking too. So I think people do realize that I like to joke around too, and I like to give people shit too. So, yeah, so, I might go through. I have a little time this afternoon. I might go through that whole message board uh, thread. Apparently, it's like ten pages or more. <laughs> Did you read it? I I might have read like, um, like maybe the first page. I don't I don't really go to went to went to thread. I probably should admit this, but once a thread kind of gets really deep, yeah, multiple pages. Usually, once it gets multiple pages, it, it it's some sort of pissing contest between a couple of posters and it's just, you know, yeah, not really worth yeah. the time. Hey, I love our inside kind of subscribers. I want to end on that note. And I, I love them too. I appreciate all the support of the inside kind of fans and this fan energy is what helps us do what we do. And so we appreciate everything. Good to good or the bad. That's right. That's inside. right. And I absolutely love the ones that attack Ross. I'm just going to put it out there. Yeah. You, you, know. some, you sometimes have some lines in there too, bashing me. I mean, I, I probably do. I can't think of any on like it's on different I mean, topics and stuff when people are joking around about different things. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, if I could take like a little pot shop. Here, my, my thing is this, and, and you and I have a good time. We, we, we joke at each other's expense. There is a difference between malicious and just kind of having fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and it's hard to convey that over Twitter and over message boards. Yeah, because so many things can take on different meaning based on tone, yeah. and you can't have tone in text. It's basically up to the interpretation of the reader. Exactly. So, yeah. Wow. But. That was a good little line there, Don. Um, okay, let's close this out. All right, a couple of things, a couple of housekeeping things. We're going to do a podcast in two weeks before National Sign Day. We are also, breaking news, bringing back the live stream on signing day. We'll probably kick that off. At 6 a.m. or whatever, whenever the first national letters of intent roll in, it'll be myself and Don and producer John in the man cave. Man Tower. Up, man Tower up at Don's house. We're gonna it's probably gonna be a little more well produced because we have the live stream technology that we did the live show with this year. So and we won't have to have the plexiglass between us. Yeah, we're all vaccinated. Um, not to offend anybody, but we're all vaccinated. Um I'm getting my booster shot tomorrow, Don. Are uh, you? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we're looking forward to it. We, we so some planning to do, but it should be very similar to last year. We'll probably add a couple of things or, and I maybe, um, yeah, we're going to think about ways to make it more interesting, more topics, uh, really get into uh, different things on, on the different recruits. We'll be breaking down the 2022 class. We'll talk about all the recruits, everything. We'll talk about UNC football, UNC basketball. We're going to have about six hours of fill, probably five, six hours. Yeah, well, uh, I, I, we haven't planned the exact details, but yeah, it's going to be a lot of time. It's going to be very similar to last year, and we got a lot of re- good reviews. I mean, a couple. It was only like a couple months ago. Someone mentioned, you know, the live stream, and I, and I was trying to figure out what the hell they were talking about, and it was about the the sign day thing. So yeah, it was fun. People popped in, popped out, and we had like yeah. two hundred lists, two hundred watchers, you know, throughout the day. Like, yeah, it's not something yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, you can, and we want you to watch from beginning to end, but it's definitely something that you could kind of put on in the background, work. Follow what's going on with signing day. Check in on us. You know, that that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so look forward to that. So big podcast, and we'll do a big live show. Let's close this out. Great episode. Got a little rant there at the end. It's been a while since I have a little a rant. Um, but hopefully it won't get me in trouble. Um, okay, top five. This is a Halloween top five. I don't know if we should hold it for next year, but we, it was a little late. We're going to knock it out because we had some people submit uh, – some answers. We asked for the top five Halloween candies. Let's just go through it. Remember, the next top five is your top five UNC signees you're most excited about. Which five signees from the 2022 class are you most excited about that? We need, I think we need at least 10 submits to Don via yeah. email, DM, or Twitter. All right. 
You want to? How are we? How are we going to read these? Okay, Halloween candies. This is your top five Halloween candies. Just go right through them. I'll start off. Ryan from Chapel Hill. Ready? Yep. Good. Five Reese's peanut butter cups. Chocolate and peanut butter are a delicious combination. Four Snickers. I don't know anyone who doesn't like a Snickers, so it's a safe bet. Three Warheads. Yes, I know you guys remember the glory of Warheads. We need to bring them back. Two Kit Kat. Simple yet delicious. And one. Milky Way, the most underappreciated candy out there. Don, your thoughts on that list? Um, I mean, any thoughts are going to be reflective on my actual list. But I mean, for the for most part, yeah. I mean, I, I like Ryan's list. I don't Milky have any Way one is aggressive, and Warheads is kind of random, but I don't, I don't mind it. Well, I so I love sour candy, so I love Warheads. I just don't associate Warheads with Halloween. You can sure. get them for sure, but it's just not something I associate with Halloween. Okay, you read the next one. All right, Michelle. This is a Michelle that we know very, very well from Carrie. Uh, number five, Nerds. Number four, Twix. Number three, Snickers. Number two, Skittles. And number one, Reese's. Your thoughts, Ross? A couple of these will be on my list. So um, okay. simple. Those are some basics. Yeah, they're good. I know, no complaints. Skittles at two, I think is a little high. Um, Skittles are great, but at two is a little high. Um, okay. God, Preston. <laughs> I was hoping Preston. you had to read this one. I met Preston. Great guy. He bought me a beer to game, but I cannot read his number one. Oh, all right. You read, you read five through two. I read number one. Okay. Five Twix. Mm -hmm. Four peanut M&Ms. I like that pick. Three Reese's cup and two Snickers. And number one, Ross's girlfriend's edible panties. Okay. All right, that's it. We're going to end on that. Girl, All does right. Your girlfriend have edible penny, panties? No comment. Okay, Don, <laughs> your top five. All right, my top five. Let me see. All right, I have number five, Skittles. Number okay. four, peanut M&Ms. Okay. So, I think they're super underrated. Better than the regular M&Ms. Number three, Twix. I feel like there's no other um, chocolate candy bar like them. Number two, Snickers. I feel like there's a there's a big gap between three and two for me. All right, number two, Snickers, okay. and number one, Reese's peanut butter cups. Wow. Okay, read those through again. I'm gonna write these down. Reese's. All right. So number one, Reese's. Number two, Snickers. Number three, Twix. Number four, peanut M and M's, and number gotcha. five, Skittles. Okay. Got it. Taste the rainbow. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, I am I'm going through candies, trying to think if I'm missing any ones. The key here is you got to think about the fruit versus chocolate, and you got to make sure you're not missing. Like, no one said Starburst. Yeah, I thought about Starburst or Skittles. That was my, for my number five. Yeah, okay. I think I have a good idea. All right, ready? Yeah. Everybody's waiting for my answers. Okay, my list is, I'm going to go peanut M&M, five. Okay. All right. I'm going to go Nerds 4. I'm not a big Nerds fan, but go ahead. Yeah, stuff in lockers. Um, I'm going to go Kit Kat 3. Okay. I'm going to go Reese's 2. Okay. And last one, Butterfinger. Ooh, okay. Did anybody All say right. that? No one said Butterfinger. I, uh, yeah. Butterfinger is underrated. I like Butterfinger. The only thing you get it in like sucking your teeth and stuff afterwards, yeah, which got, might be a good thing. Yeah, it's got the flaky kind of uh, butter yeah. stuff. Okay, guys, that is a long show for us. We long appreciate show. everything. Um, check out Giant T shirt, giant t shirt.com. We want to thank Mr. Green, Andre Green, for hopping on. That was a great interview. And we want to shout out Blue Shark Vodka. If you're celebrating for the holidays, go out and get a fifth or a handle of Blue Shark Vodka at your local ABC store. Anything else, Don? You good? I'm good. I'm excited for the uh, live show and we are going to, we don't have the exact details, but we're going to have, as you mentioned, a pre, a, a, I guess a signing day preview podcast, which will come out actually earlier than typically. Yeah. We already mentioned Look that. for that. Okay, great. All right. Thanks guys. Appreciate it.